All right, today then, <clears throat> we're gonna go through the graphs of tangent and cotangent, all right? Um, we'll talk about each of those. We'll talk about how we'll go about graphing them. Like I said, pretty similar process at least. There'll be a couple of things that we really have to, to emphasize the difference between these graphs <clears throat> and the sine and cosine graphs. And then we're gonna look at graphs and try to come up with the equations for them based on that. So first thing we need to talk about real quick is what a vertical asymptote is. So if you've never heard of this, vertical asymptote is just a vertical line that a function can't cross, all right? The graph is never going to cross that particular vertical line. The function doesn't exist at that point. Um, but as we get closer and closer, to that vertical line, the y values of our function increase or decrease without bound. They go off to an infinitely high number or down to an infinitely negative, or infinitely high negative number, all right? <clears throat> so they'll always approach those vertical asymptotes by going off to infinity or negative infinity, right? And the reason we bring this up here is because the graph of the tangent function and cotangent are going to involve uh, vertical asymptotes which makes sense if we think about the, um, what did they, what they call quotient identities. Tangent of X was equivalent to what? What's another way of writing tangent of X? Using a, well, the quotient identity. Anyone remember? Any identity, throw any identity out there at least. Uh, the what? The x is for uh, tangent versus x. Yeah, well, um, how, so how can I rewrite tangent of, of x? Yeah, tangent in parentheses x. Cotangent 1 over x? I can write it as opposite that, 1 over cotangent of x. Oh. Or I could also write it using a couple of other functions. Uh, sine over cosine. There we go. Tangent of X is the same as sine of X over cosine of X, which is important to remember here when we talk about where these asymptotes are going to happen. Since tangent is the same as sine over cosine, then if cosine is equal to zero at a particular point, then the function tangent of X can't exist there because I'd be dividing by zero. So that's where those asymptotes for tangent of X are gonna be at. If we remember that quotient identity, we can find those um, or at least get an idea of where they're supposed to be at before we move things around. All right. That's why it says first up there that the domain of tangent of X is going to be all values of X, except for when X is a, a an odd multiple of pi over two. All right. Because cosine of pi over two is zero. Cosine of three pi over two is zero. Cosine of negative pi over two is zero. Um, we'd be dividing by zero there. So anywhere where cosine would be zero, tangent is gonna be undefined, all right? The range, the possible y values, as we said, we're, we're approaching these asymptotes, gonna be from negative infinity to positive infinity. I can get closer and closer to those vertical asymptotes, and I will just keep getting a larger and larger number, either positively or negatively, all right? And this will give us the basic points that we're going to graph around here, all right? Um, Anytime we're basing it a shift or anything else, again, this is still a periodic function, all right? Tangent and cotangent are periodic functions just like sine and cosine. They're going to repeat. They're just not continuous. They're, they're not going to be a smooth curve. They're going to repeat after we have these asymptotes. So the one that we'll, we'll typically start with, kind of like we started at x equals zero for sine or cosine, like on the y-axis, um, we'll start with... <coughs> for tangent, sorry, for tangent, we'll start with the period of the function that goes through the origin here. And it has uh, an asymptote at negative pi over two, another asymptote or the other asymptote for the period at pi over two. All right, again, the two places where cosine would be undefined. The other important points here are not the quadrantal angles in between there, because there's, there's really not any in between negative pi over two and pi over two except for zero. But at negative pi over four, tangent of negative pi over four is negative one. At pi over four, tangent of pi over four is equal to one. So that'll at least give us a couple of points where we can base 
the, the, the graph off of as we're drawing it through here. I can have this negative pi over four and negative one, positive pi over four and one up there, and then zero, zero, then I can connect those points that way and just make sure that the rest of the graph approaches the asymptotes without ever crossing it. All right, and I say those are important because again, if I have, uh, if I multiply the graph by two or by negative three or something, that's, those are the points that we're gonna change. All right, so far so good. This is just going to explain a lot of that. All right, it's discontinuous. It has asymptotes, vertical asymptotes at the odd multiples of pi over two. The intercepts, so wherever it crosses the x-axis, the basic graph, again, if we're not shifting it vertically or horizontally or whatever, the x-intercepts are gonna be at the integer multiples of pi, which again should make sense for us. That's when it's gonna be equal to zero because any integer multiple of pi sine is equal to zero. Sine of zero is zero. Sine of pi is zero. Sine of two pi, sine of negative pi. Sine is equal to zero there and cosine is equal to either one or negative one. So I'm gonna get that it's equal to zero at any integer multiple of pi there. All right, biggest change. I mean, I, I'm gonna say it's still the biggest change from what we've been doing before uh, because of how we base, you know, finding the period and things like that. The period of tangent and of cotangent are going to just be equal to pi, all right? They're not equal to two pi. They repeat themselves faster than sine and cosine do, all right? That's because they're going through those zero points. So I get those, those asymptotes in half the time, all right? The period of tangent is pi, not two pi, right? We say that the graph doesn't have an amplitude because it doesn't have a maximum or a minimum that it goes through. Uh, I, I might still use that word a little bit when we start talking about, I mean, I can, again, I can multiply by a number out in front of the tangent function. I can say y equals two tangent of x. All that's gonna do is stretch the graph vertically or if I have a number between zero and one, it's gonna shrink it vertically. So those points, even though we say it doesn't have an amplitude, I can still move those, those particular values at negative pi over four to negative one, while I could stretch that to negative two, and I could stretch one up to two for pi over four if I'm multiplying by a particular value. I might say that and say amplitude there, even though that's not technically what amplitude means, um, but technically we don't have amplitude for tangent or for cotangent. Uh, it doesn't mean we can't multiply by a coefficient and change what the graph looks like. It just means it stretches or compresses in a vertical direction, all right? And then it's symmetric with respect to the origin, so it's an odd function, right? Importantly, what that means, tangent of negative x is equal to tangent of x, or sorry, negative tangent of x. And if we need to graph something, we can make this a little easier on ourselves by graphing the negative of tangent of x instead of trying to figure out what's going on inside of that function, all right? So odd function, symmetric with respect to the origin, we've never really talked about how we graph that anyways, and it gets a little complicated. All right, so far so good. All right, cotangent, very, very similar. All right, except that cotangent of x is equal to what in terms of a quotient identity? Yeah, it's cosine over sine. And so my, my vertical asymptotes there where it's gonna be undefined is when sine is equal to zero. Those are the integer multiples of pi. Zero, pi, and two pi, negative pi, negative three pi, whatever. Integer multiples of pi. So the domain of this function where it's actually defined, every value of x except for the integer multiples of pi that we have. All right, the range still negative infinity to infinity, right? Can still have any possible y value, positive or negative. As long as we just get close enough to that vertical asymptote, I can still get, I can go to 10,000. It's gonna be really close to where x is equal to zero, but I can get even closer to x equals zero and I can get 100,000, something like that. So the range is infinite, negative infinity to infinity, the possible y values. All right, and again, similar idea here when we talk about the values 
that we'll use to find so, some of those important points that will help us graph the function. Um, again, at zero, since sine is equal to zero at that point, undefined, we have an asymptote there, same with pi. So obviously the period for this one is pi as well. That's when it's going to start repeating itself. Pi over four, we have that cotangent is equal to one. All right, cotangent pi over four is equal to one, just like tangent is because sine over cosine, they're both still positive there. All right, at pi over two is equal to zero because that's where cosine is zero and sine is one. And then cotangent of three pi over four is negative one. All right, those are the points again that we'll plug in here to get an idea of what the graph looks like, if it's stretched a little bit or compressed a little bit, um, or if we move it back and forth. Those are the important points to remember when we start doing that. So that would be a phase shift? So uh, a negative phase shift, like if, we're, if we put it into a graph? You could write this, I was gonna bring that up towards the end, but yeah, this is, it. it's the graph of tangent flipped over and also moved to the right or to the left, I guess, if you will. So it'll be a uh, reflection on the axis, it won't be a phase shift? It would be a reflection and a phase shift, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, also, but good point to note here that if the way that we started with tangent, I say our starting, our reference period that we're going to talk about will be negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 for that one. Our reference period for cotangent will start with 0 to pi. Now, again, that can move. We could shift that uh, in a phase shift horizontally or whatever, but that's our, our starting point. We'll just draw the rest of the periods after we figure out that basic one that we're going to go to go with. All right, much like we did zero to two pi for sine and cosine. That's how we're gonna start with this. All right, um, another one says the same kind of stuff. So discontinuous, it has the vertical asymptotes at the integer multiples of pi, any n times pi. All right, x intercepts where it crosses the x axis are going to be those odd multiples of pi over two because that's where Again, cosine is zero and sine is not zero. And then period of cotangent also equal to pi. Also doesn't have an amplitude for the same reason that we talked about before, because it's not really technically a maximum or minimum value. And then it's also symmetric with respect to the origin. So it's also an odd function. And that means cotangent of negative x is equal to negative cotangent of x. All right. The reason both tangent and cotangent are odd functions is because sine is an odd function, cosine is an even function. So it's either an odd over an even function or an even over an odd function. One of them's odd, it makes the overall odd. All right. But remember this again, this can help us a little bit just to, to graph it a little bit easier. All right. Let's actually try to get, oh. Yes, if you're going to graph them, by the way, uh, if you're going to check an answer or anything like that on a calculator, typically we don't have cotangent. So if you're going to graph cotangent, use the reciprocal identity or use that quotient identity. So, you know, they're going to have tangent of x but and cosine and sine, possibly not cotangent. Not really totally relevant to what we're doing. So here's what we're going to do. We'll go through the steps first so that we're clear on what the differences are. Uh, between what we did with sine and cosine and then what we're going to do with tangent and with cotangent. All right. First thing is to find the period, just like we did before. But remember, it's going to be pi over b and not 2 pi over b. All right. If we want to find those, those starting asymptotes, the place where we're going to at least put the first period that we'll draw and then we can draw more than that on either side. All right. If we're dealing with tangent, I have y equals a tangent of bx, then I'm just going to set whatever's inside the tangent function, that bx, or if there was, you know, b times x minus d, if we have a, a phase shift, we'll do that too. Um, set whatever's inside the tangent function equal to negative pi over 2 and to pi over 2, and then solve for x. That'll give us the vertical asymptotes that we're going to start with. All right. Again, just based on if you can remember this graph, you know, this is where the basic tangent function had negative pi over two and pi over two. So when we change the period of the graph, let's get back to, there we go. 
change the period of the graph, I'm just gonna set whatever's inside of the tangent function equal to those two values where our normal our, where normally our asymptotes would be at. Same goes for cotangent, except that for cotangent, those asymptotes would normally be at zero and pi. So I'm gonna set whatever's inside the cotangent function equal to zero and equal to pi. Solve for X to get the asymptotes that we're gonna base everything off of, all right? Sketch those vertical asymptotes. And then once I know where those are at, it's kind of like, you know, where we, we have our starting points for sine or cosine. After I do that, I just need to divide that interval into four equal parts, just like we were doing before. All right. One of those, the middle part should give me, you know, if we, if we haven't had a vertical shift or anything, should give me the X intercept. That middle point should be the X intercept. And then that first fourth and that third fourth on either side should give me where that negative one point and that positive one point were, or you know, however we have to, to plug into the function. Right? So divide into four after we find those asymptotes, and then plug in the points like those wherever we divided it up to find those x values, plug those in, figure out the y values plot those, join them with the curve, all right? Just remember the curve's not gonna look like sine or cosine, obviously, it's gonna go between the asymptotes. It'll go off to negative infinity somewhere or to, on one of them and positive infinity on the other one. We just have to kind of figure out what that looks like. Might not necessarily be negative to positive for tangent, depending on what our, our A value is at the front, um, but it's gonna go off to infinity and off to negative infinity on one end and the other. All right, all right. So let's say we'll start with a simple one. I wanna graph y equals tangent of two x. So first thing I would do is what? Yeah, I'm gonna find the period. So I know v is two, the period of this is gonna be oh, what? Two. Yeah, it'll just be pi over two, all right. So in order to figure out where those asymptotes are, I probably should have asked this before throwing that up there. In order to figure out where the asymptotes are then, I'm still gonna do essentially the same thing we were doing at the end when we had all the crazy transformations for sine and cosine. I'm gonna set whatever's inside the tangent function. In this case, I'm gonna, instead of setting it equal to zero or two pi or less than, greater than whatever. <coughs> all right, I'm going to set it equal to the normal left asymptote that we're dealing with for tangent, which is negative pi over two. And then I'm also going to set it equal to the normal right asymptote for tangent, that's pi over two. And then just solve for x, so divide both of those by two. I get the two asymptotes are negative pi over four and pi over four, which that's nice because the distance from negative pi over four to pi over four is what? Mm -hmm. Total distance between them. Over two. Yeah, it's pi over two, which is what we said the, the period is going to be equal to. All right. It's always nice to have that kind of check. After I find these two asymptotes, I'm going to do what? In fact, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and plot them first. So I can put those two on a graph, pi over four, negative pi over four there. And then what? Take this interval and yeah, split it up into four parts. So I'm going to split that up. I mean, I can take the total distance. Remember, I know the total distance between them is pi over two. So I can multiply that by one fourth. Pi over two times one fourth is pi over eight. So I'm just going to add pi over eight to the left endpoint until I get to the right endpoint. So negative pi over four plus pi over eight is negative pi over eight. Plus another pi over eight is gonna get me to zero. Plus another pi over eight gets me to pi over eight. And then if I added it one more time, I have pi over four, which is the right asymptote. All right, same idea again. I, when we're talking about dividing it into four parts, same idea as before. Not doing anything differently just because they're asymptotes they, as opposed to just starting points on the graph, same idea. All right, and then plug those in. 
So I'm going to, again, table so that hopefully we end up, notice I'm not going to end up with the quadrantal angles again. Well, I mean, I end up with zero, so that one counts. But if I plug in X and then multiply it by two, I get negative pi over four. That's what I want to happen for a tangent, uh, not for cotangent, because that one was a positive pi over four, three pi over four. But looking at negative pi over four here, zero and pi over four, um, values that we can plug into tangent that you know we, we can know and should know, tangent of negative pi over four is negative one, tangent of zero is zero, tangent of pi over four is one. All right, and that just gives me those points, the X and the Y values, plot them on the graph. If we need to, I can just start repeating the graph on either side of those two asymptotes so that it's periodic if we need more than one period. All right, but note where those points are. Again, have the asymptotes at negative pi over four and pi over four, at negative pi over eight, negative one, at pi over eight, it's one, and then at zero, it's equal to zero. Those three points tell me basic the basic shape of the graph there. Who are the outside? Those are just uh, half of a period on the other side of that asymptote and another half. Yeah. I mean, this one would technically continue on down until we get to um, negative three pi over four would be the next asymptote here. And then a positive three pi over four would be the next one here. And that one would just go up to infinity. So there. The four points there. So it's just that, I mean, it's just repeating the same graph, yeah, the, same, the same graph that we have in between there, but um, it's only showing half of it on this one or half of each part. All right, makes sense, good deal, same idea. Remember, period of tangent, cotangent normally are equal to pi. So pi over b gives us the period for anything like this. Let's say I want to graph y equals negative three tangent of one half x. First thing I would go ahead and do with this, find the period. So pi over one half is two pi, All right? Give me the total period there. If I wanna figure out where the asymptotes are gonna be, I'm gonna set what equal to what? Actually two different things. Negative two pi and two pi. Uh, not negative two pi to two pi. Now be careful with that. I want to set whatever's inside the tangent function. So in this case, that one half X equal to what's the normal, again, the normal asymptotes for tangent. Negative pi over five. Yeah, negative. Well, they're normally negative pi over two to pi over two. They're going to end up changing for this. So if I set one half X equal to negative pi over two, multiply both sides by two, I'm going to get x is equal to negative pi. If I set one half x equal to a positive pi over two, multiply both sides by two, I get a positive pi. So that's going to tell me where those asymptotes are going to be. All right. And if, again, if there's no horizontal shift or anything like that, you can also just take the period. This only goes for tangents. So we have to be careful because tangents, the one that goes through zero, that goes through the origin. Um, you could just take half of that and, you know, on either side, if the total period is two pi, it's got to be pi to the left of zero and pi to the right. That'll give us the two asymptotes. You can do it that way. You just have to be very careful. Make sure there's not a horizontal shift and make sure that's tangent because it doesn't work for cotangent. So that's not where our asymptotes start at. All right. You want to take the same process every time, set whatever's inside the tangent function equal to negative pi over two and equal to pi over two and solve. All right, and graph those. Um, divide that interval from negative pi to pi into four parts. Simple enough, the total distance is two pi. Multiply that by one fourth, I get pi over two. So negative pi plus pi over two is negative pi over two. Add another pi over two, I get zero. Another one, I get pi over two. And add another one, I end up at the right asymptote of pi. All right, plug those in um, to the function. And I end up with a value of three 
for negative pi over two when x is negative pi over two. I get zero when x is zero. And then I get a value of negative three when x is a positive pi over two there. So I can already kind of tell what's happening here. As I move left to right, I'm going from a positive value to zero to a negative value. It's not gonna look like the normal tangent function. It's gonna look like it's what? Because if I'm going from a higher value down to a lower value, it's not the normal tangent function which increases. This one's just flipped over, which makes sense just like with all of our sine and cosine functions, that that a value out in front is negative, that coefficient out in front's negative, and it's gonna be flipped over the x-axis, reflected about the x-axis. So when I plot that, it actually looks very similar to a cotangent curve, except for the fact that our asymptotes are um, on either side of the, the y-axis there, all right? And they don't start at zero and two pi or anything like that. That's what it looks like. Again, I'm just plotting those three points, drawing a smooth curve between them. And if it decreases, then at the right asymptote, it goes off to negative infinity. And it goes off to positive infinity at the left one. Otherwise, you know, if it was increasing, it's just the opposite. All right? Questions on that? Again, find the period, find the two asymptotes that go along with that. Divide it into four parts, plug those in. All right. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyways, so if I were to look at this, if we're trying to figure out just based on the actual graph, y equals negative three tangent of one half x. All right. The notes that we'll bring up for this one, period's going to be bigger because remember, just like with sine and cosine, if that B value was between zero and one, it stretched out. We had a longer period there. If it was greater than one, it was shorter. So this one has a larger period because that B is between zero and one there. All right, it's stretched vertically. Again, those points that we use as reference points, um, instead of being at negative one, it's down to negative three. Instead of being at one, it's up to three. It's stretched out vertically because that a value, not the amplitude, although you can kind of think of it that way, um, is a negative three. And that value, at least of three, the absolute value of that is going to be greater than one. All right. And then it's flipped along the or around the x axis because A is negative. And, you know, that's going to flip the graph. Every, every value that would normally be a positive value now becomes negative, And every value that would be negative becomes positive. All right. All right, just notes on what we find just by doing exactly what we were doing before anyways. Make sense, questions on that. All right, then let's do one with cotangent. So graph y equals one half cotangent of two x. period of this function is going to be pi over 2. Again, it's always pi over b for tangent and cotangent instead of 2 pi over b. b is 2 in this case, so period is going to be pi over 2. The asymptotes that I'm looking for, I'm going to set that 2x part, much like we did when we had tangent of 2x. I'm going to set 2x equal to what two values since we're dealing with cotangent now zero and pi over two zero and uh well i'm going to end up with pi over two i'm set it equal to the normal asymptotes for cotangent are at x equals zero and x equals pi so i'm going to set those oops, there we go set 2x equal to zero set 2x equal to pi and then solve for x, I get x is zero still, and then x equals pi over two, all right? Makes sense, again, if we haven't shifted anything um, and we're starting with that asymptote at zero, whatever the period is should be where the next asymptote is. Should be pr pretty straightforward there. 
But do remember the difference between the set whatever's inside the cotangent function equal to zero and equal to pi, set whatever's inside the tangent function equal to negative pi over two and pi over two, if we're talking about finding those asymptotes to start with, all right? So I've got those. I'm gonna divide that interval between zero and pi over two into four parts. Uh, should be very, fairly obvious where we're going with that. Pi over two times one fourth is pi over eight. So zero plus pi over eight is pi over eight. Plus pi over eight again is two pi over eight or pi over four. And then plus pi over eight again is three pi over eight. And plus pi over eight one more time is four pi over eight, which is pi over two is where we're at. All right, plug those into the function that we have, y equals one half cotangent of two x. All right, and I could say, Remember, cotangent of 2 times pi over 8 is cotangent of pi over 4. Cotangent of pi over 4 was equal to 1. All right, cotangent of 2 times pi over 4 would be cotangent of pi over 2. So that's going to be equal to 0. Cotangent of 2 times 3 pi over 8 is cotangent of 3 pi over 4. That was negative 1. And I'm just going to multiply all those by 1 half. So I get y coordinates at each of those of 1 half, 0, at negative one half, all right? Again, just plugging into the function. Use I, I would say go ahead and use a table. I know a couple of these haven't. It's kind of just jumping through that. We, we've seen how we've used the tables before. Uh, it's not any different. Just use them the same way and get to those Y coordinates, all right? Put those on a graph. Asymptotes first and then those points in between. And I get a function that looks something like this. All right. Not necessarily drawn the best way because it's hard for us to kind of differentiate here between what this is and then, you know, the original cotangent graph. Um, but if I were to graph these next to each other, the graph of one half cotangent of 2x is going to look like it's what? compared to just cotangent of 2x. It would be uh, broader, I mean. The, it, it's definitely got a... Um, like water? Well, it'll have a smaller period here, which is kind of hard, again, to see just because of the way these are based. But that one half means I'm going to do what with the normal graph? Instead of... Instead of like with the last example where we multiplied by a three, a negative three technically, and it stretched the graph out, multiplying by a one half there is going to compress the graph. It's going to get small. Again, hard to see here because, you know, in the, the other graphs that we had, this was already just negative one and negative two. Um, but if we graph them on the same spot, it's going to look like it, it kind of goes and is squeezed together a little where these points are. This part's going to be just a little bit flatter where we cross the x-axis. It's going to flatten out a little bit just because these values right here where we split it up are only at negative one half and positive one half instead of negative one and positive one. And that's because it's less than one. And that's because it's less than one. Yeah, because the amplitude, well, because a is less than one. I should say between zero and one. All right. Let's say we do a vertical translation. So graph y equals two plus tangent of x. Pretty simple one to start with. This again, much like with sine and cosine, um, but this again, probably even more so for tangent and cotangent mm -hmm. because we don't have a good reference point on the maxes and mins, things like that, is going to be where you know these middle points especially really come into play knowing where those are so that I can just take the value of each one and do what with it. This is just going to be the normal graph of tangent of X, but with what happening? Vertical translation. Yeah, vertical translation of two units. So I know it's going to go between negative pi over two and pi over two. I know it's going to be increasing because we're not doing anything with tangent. Um, all I'm doing is adding two to each of those values. So where it normally crosses the x-axis is at zero. Now it's gonna cross, sorry, crosses, oh, crosses the x and the y-axis there. 
So I'm going to take that point and now I'm going to move it up two. So on the y axis, it's going to cross it two instead. The next point over at pi over four is going to be at three instead of one. So at negative pi over four, I'm going to end up at a positive one instead of a negative one. All right. And we're using, again, just those points in between that we normally had, the ones that were on that table, the very first slide that we had for tangent or cotangent if we were using that we're using those those particular values because i know the exact value of tangent of pi over four it's equal to one tangent of negative pi over four is negative one anything in between there we get into you know the square root of threes and and all of that kind of stuff um, and that's not easy for us to graph but the ones that we can put on there that are exact that we know um, are those values at least normally at pi over four, negative pi over four, and zero, or at pi over four, pi over two, and three pi over four for cotangent. All right, which is everything shifted up by two units. Um, that's what those graphs look like compared to each other. The graph of tangent of x and two plus tangent of x. Uh, I actually like, uh, even though we won't use calculator to kind of find that. I like this example because it also does show that they still have the same asymptotes. There might be a, a distance. There's always, there's always a distance of two between these two graphs. It just so happens that as we get closer and closer to that asymptote and the numbers become say negative 10,000 and then negative 9,998, doesn't really look like a whole lot and they're gonna get much, much closer. So they look like they're, they're converging together. They're never actually going to touch. The top one is still always two units higher, um, but they do look like they converge at those asymptotes because they're still both going off to either infinity or negative infinity as we get to those. All right. Graph y equals negative two minus cotangent of x minus pi over four. I believe this is the last one. So we will go through the method of doing it the same way we've done it before, but I can already at least say what I expect to see from this based on everything that's written up there right now. So because what's inside the cotangent is X minus pi over four, I know that the period of cotangent is still what? Still pi because there's no B in front of the X or, or in front of the X minus pi over four. So the period of it hasn't changed. The minus pi over four in there means I'm gonna have a cotangent graph that is what? Phase shifted to the right. Phase shifted to the right by pi over four units. All right, the negative in front of the cotangent, not the negative two, but the negative in front of the cotangent means what? Yeah, it's gonna be reflected about the x-axis. All right, the, the amplitude, the stretching or compressing doesn't change. But because it's minus cotangent, it's going to be flipped from what it normally would be. And then the negative two out in front of that means what? Yeah, that'll be a vertical shift. Everything's going to be moved down two units. All right. So I know at least what to expect and what it should look like when I find these points. We'll still go through that process. Again, period is still pi because the B that we have up there is one. All right. It's going to be flipped about the x-axis because that a value is negative one. And then the phase shift is going to be pi over four units to the right because x minus d means d is a positive pi over four in this case. All right. Wait, so there's like, okay, the x-axis and the y-axis. Um, so cotangent tangent, are they only going to be the x-axis reflection? Uh, yeah, yes, we'll only treat them. So we'll only treat them as reflections over the X axis. There are ways to talk about around the Y axis, but we don't do that in this class. Okay, so the yeah. previous sign cosine that was X axis translation to right? That was X axis, re yeah, reflections, okay. yeah. There are ways to do it, but you can always, the, um, uh, yeah, and the graph translated down two units. The way to reflect about the Y axis is to take say cotangent of negative x 
and then that that does a y reflection however the reason we don't get into it is because i can write cotangent of negative x as just negative cotangent of x which is just a reflection about the x-axis and that makes it easier for us so we don't have to deal with it once if we know that particular type of identity all right so all the stuff that we said before it came up on the slide if i'm going to find the asymptote state if i want to actually graph this i mean i could I, I could just take what we know shift everything um but again if we're looking at this as a process that you could go through every time set whatever's inside the cotangent function equal to both zero and equal to pi because again those are where our normal asymptotes are going to be for cotangent all right and then solve for x so add pi over four to zero add pi over four to pi we get pi over four and five pi over four which again should be just a shift to the right as we would think all right the same process again every time if we're doing it if we do this we're not going to mess it up all right if i divide that into four parts i know the total distance was pi we already said that's the period so divide that by four i just get pi over four so I'm going to take pi over 4 plus pi over 4 and get pi over 2, and then plus pi over 4 again and get 3 pi over 4, plus pi over 4 again, 3 pi over 2. All those good spots. All right, sorry, pi, not 3 pi over 2. All right, 4 pi over 4. Take each of those, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, and pi. Plug those into the original function. Again, all the way back here, the negative 2 minus cotangent of x minus pi over 4. And when I do that, you know, pi over 2 minus pi over 4 is what's inside the cotangent. That's pi over 2 minus pi over 4 is just pi over 4. That's one of those special values for tangent or cotangent. I know cotangent of pi over 4 is 1. And then I'm just going to take that 1 and take negative 2 minus 1. That's where this negative 3 comes from. All right, and then 3 pi over 4 minus pi over 4 is pi over 2. Well, cotangent of pi over 2 is 0. Negative 2 minus 0 is negative 2. Again, you can do these on a table if you want to make sure everything stays completely correct and we're not making any mistakes anywhere. Always a good idea, but that's where those come from. We're plugging those x values into the, the function, get the y values. And then just plot them um, between, this would be the first one, this, this is the one that we're plotting asymptote at pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, and then those points that we just found, those coordinates that we're plotting there. If I need a second period of the graph, I can draw this one over here, all right? Or I could draw the one to the right of it, either way. All right, whoops, where did I go? There it is. Makes sense, any questions on that? Oh, I forgot there is one other thing that's going to happen at this one. We still got five minutes, so it's okay. Good deal on graphing, tangent, cotangent, and all that stuff. Not a lot of, of fundamental differences in the way that we go about it, but remember the asymptotes, and then we'll, we'll just go from that. Point. All right, last thing is actually finding the equation of a function given the graph. So I want to determine the equation for this function right here. It's got asymptotes at negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, goes through the origin. It also goes through negative pi over 4 and a positive 2, and then a positive pi over 4 and negative 2. So the first thing to determine here, if I'm going to try to make this as easy on myself as possible, is this going to be tangent or cotangent? We have to be careful because I know we've already seen examples of this. Which one would probably be easier to actually figure out? in this case tangent why tangent here instead of cotangent yeah goes through the origin all right that way i don't have to do if i was doing cotangent which seems natural because it's a decreasing function like cotangent is but if we were doing that i'd have to account for a phase shift because cotangent doesn't normally go through the origin it has an asymptote on that x equals zero so it's probably easier to deal with tangent here because it goes through that and I just need to make sure I know that instead of increasing, it's decreasing, so it's going to be reflected about the x-axis. All right? So <laughs> it's reflected about the x-axis. I know, I should already say, well, this one doesn't mention it. Does the period of it change? Let me get rid of that. 
as the period of tangent changed if I'm using tangent. First asymptotes negative pi over two, second one's pi over two. Oh, it's the same one. All right, so I haven't changed the period. The only thing I've done is stretch it and then flip it around the x-axis. So instead of going through, you know, a negative one there, it goes through negative two. Instead of going through one, it goes through two. So I'm just going to have an a value that's equal to negative two. All right, y equals negative two tangent of x. And in a similar way, just so that we're clear on what this looks like, I have a graph like this one. It's got asymptotes at zero and pi over two. It's decreasing from there. Um, it goes through pi over uh, eight and zero, goes through pi over four and negative one, and then three pi over eight and negative two. Which one, which of the two functions should I use for this one? Probably should use cotangent because my asymptote already starts at zero. Now, does the period change for cotangent here? Yeah, because yeah, normally the second one, the, the other asymptote is where? It's at pi. Now it's at pi over two, so we have a, a smaller period here. I know B is going to be different. I also know that this is shifted downward by one because that's you know where that point ends up. All right. I do know it's not stretched or compressed because from this point, this middle point where it kind of changes, it goes up one and over one, or I say over one, but over one unit of our split and then down one and over one unit there. So it's not multiplied by two or negative three or anything like that. All right. So knowing all of that, I, I'm going to have to make sure to account for what B is. So since the normal period is pi over b and then that's equal to pi over two here i know b is going to be equal to two all right i'm just going to set those same way we did for, for sine and cosine instead of me and then just shift everything down one by saying negative one plus that cotangent of two x all right probably should finish up here makes sense go i again i would say normally based this off the, the last slide says that we can actually write tangent or cotangent, um, any of these graphs in the same same type of way. I can write this graph, I can say that that's also the graph of negative one minus cotangent of negative two X. I can write as negative one minus tangent of two X minus pi over two because I can shift tangent. But we prefer to keep it as simple as possible if we can. Um, try to keep it as simple with, you know, avoiding too many negatives inside of the, the functions, avoiding any phase shifts if we can, it's just easier for us to deal with. All right, but still possible to do them both, both of those ways. This is just noting, try to keep it as simple as possible. All right, that is it for 4.3. Um, as I mentioned last time, the retake for test number one, is tonight from 8 to 10. Um, I mean, again, if you shouldn't take that long, so if you can't log in until 8.30 or even 9, it still should be perfectly fine um, to finish. It'll be available then. It'll just come up on Blackboard. I want to go ahead and emphasize one more time. You don't have to retake it. If you're fine with your grade, if you only miss like one question or two questions and you, you don't want to study for it, try to go through the stress of doing it, and you don't think you're, you think you'll probably just possibly mess one, one up again, you know, you don't have to worry about it. If you want to try for that perfect score, it's perfectly fine also. I don't care. Um, do, do whatever you want to do. I'm going to take the highest grade. I'm not averaging them. I'm not taking the second one. If you happen to take it and do worse, um, I'll take the highest of the two. So there's no penalty for taking it. Um, even if you already got a high grade. So if you want to, you can. If you don't want to spend your time on it, again, you won't have to. We just, just want to make sure we're all clear on that so when someone sees it later on, it's like, okay. All right, um, eight o'clock. Haven't heard from anyone, so if that time doesn't work, we got like, I don't know, about four hours before I'm like, yeah, it's too late. So tell me ahead of time now so that I can make arrangements for that. All right, good deal. I will see you guys on 
Friday then. We'll finish up now. 4.4. I think there's two more sections of this, of chapter four. So 4.4 on Friday. So the next test covers what thing? Next chat the next test will cover chapters four and five. And then six would be on its own test? Yeah, and then we'll do uh I'm gonna go ahead and do it kind of the same way as last year. So next test will cover four and five, and then the one after will be six and seven. And then we'll we'll cover parts of chapter eight after we do that, um, which will be on the final, but there won't be a specific test during the year that has chapter eight on it. So the final is cumulative. Finals cumulative, yeah. And then we'll have a review just like the first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just I'll post as many problems as I can find to, to review over everything. Yeah, we'll get to that point, you know, a little bit later on. But okay. all right. Any questions before I get out of here? I don't know if that guy's still holding class it's, after ours, it's, but it's just yeah. Sorry, uh it's just on Blackboard, right? Just the same place. Yeah, yes, yeah, so the same thing. It'll be on Blackboard. It'll the test will come up. It'll it'll appear at eight, kind of like last one did. It'll appear right below the first test, and it'll say thirteen twenty one test one retake, and you'll you'll just take it the same way as you did um, the first one. Okay. 